welcome uh, everyone to uh, today's lecture by Fox Harrell. Um, with really, a, he may win the prize for the longest title of the year, <laughs> Phantasmal Media Poetics, and you can read um, the rest. Uh, I just wanted to say a couple things, and then I'll ask Stuart Mothup to introduce Fox. Um, we've got a couple other C21 events coming up this month. It's kind of, it's a jam-packed month. Next uh, Friday is uh, Elena Kim talking about migratory flyways uh, in a really interesting way that maps uh, together um, bird migration, uh, Air Force flight paths, and things like that. So super interesting talk next Friday. The following Friday, we will be visited by the MLA subcommittee, is that technically the correct name? Which is a group of um, uh, MLA revolutionaries, uh, people trying to actually uh, change the structure of the MLA to account for the increased adjunctification of the profession and uh, try to make the MLA more responsive to those changing labor conditions. So they'll be presenting uh, as a panel. We're having them here to uh, do a couple days of work at the center, and then they'll be presenting uh, on Friday, our usual 3.30 time. And then the first Friday in December, to, to finish off this uh, semester's uh, presentations, Tom Gunning will be here from the University of Chicago uh, with a to-be-announced title. Um, but always certainly to be good. Anyway, uh, my pleasure to ask Stuart, who's known Fox for uh, quite some time, to uh, introduce him. So I'll turn it over. So Fox Harrell is Associate Professor of Digital Media in the Comparative Media Studies Program and the Computer Science and Artificial Intelligence Laboratory at MIT. His research explores the relationship between imaginative cognition, and computation by developing new forms of, of narrative, gaming, and social media. He received an NSF career, and that's all in caps, if you know what that means, <laughs> career award uh, for his project, Computing for Advanced Identity Representation. He holds a PhD in computer science and cognitive science from the University of California, San Diego. Before coming to MIT, he taught for several years at the Georgia Institute of Technology. I always like to get our tech plug in. Um, his book, Phantasmal Media, An Approach to Imagination, Computation, and Expression, was published by MIT Press last year. In that book, he writes, the idea of cultural computing represents an important nexus of cultural grounding, social values, and expression of ideas within society. It is important because ignoring the role of culture in system design is a major cause of failure of computing systems. Even more significantly, it is important because for cultural co computing systems to have transformational effects upon minds and societies, they need to be addressed with the same nuance exhibited by the best of humanities researchers and artists exploring and creating other media. At the same time, these nuanced analysis and design principles need to be based on an understanding of the uniquely computational aspects of their media. The elegance of expression of that statement may belie the difficulty of what it describes. Fox Harrell belongs to a generation of polymath creators who are changing both the way we understand computing systems and the systems themselves. And doing those two things at the same time is worse than juggling, trust me. Um, I, I never attempted myself. Um, Fox is as illuminating about the mysteries of code as he is clear in his uniquely American idea of culture with roots of equal depth in Africa, Asia, and Europe. At a time when so much discussion of media focuses on dysfunction and disappointment, hashtag please don't ask me about Gamergate, uh, even though we've already begun talking about Gamergate this morning. Uh, at a time when so much just seems so dark, Harold's work conjures powerful phantasms, ghosts in machines, boys in hoods, haints and seraphs, who just might lead us, although we were sort of disclaiming the utopianism this morning, who just might lead us, as we like to say in Wisconsin, forward. So forward, Fox, please.
Well, thank you, Stuart, for the very gracious introduction. Thank you, Richard, for inviting me, uh, and uh, uh, Emily, and Nat, and everybody that's uh, been helping to facilitate and make this a possible. A possible. And thanks to you also for uh, coming. And so I think it's the subtitle that's actually the long part to hear. The title of the talk today is Phantasmal Media Poetics. So we're looking at some of the kind of cultural and expressive, expressive dimensions of what I call phantasmal media. And uh, you can think overall, you know, what is the kind of work that I do? Some, of the, some people here were at a seminar I gave uh, earlier today where I described how my work is about developing and better understanding systems that are used for uh, not only creative expression, but also conceptual change as well as a social change. And so you'll see some of that in the systems that, that I show. And so here's a structure of what I'll, what I'll talk about today. I'll, I'll talk to you a little bit about what do I even mean by this idea of phantasmal media, and why is it uh, phantasmal or haunting in some ways. Uh, the answer is that because it has worldview and culture uh, built into it. Uh, and uh, I'll give an example of an analysis of a particular uh, game, uh, kind of in-depth analysis of a game of life and death, we could say. And then I'll move on to talking about one particular form uh, where I look at how cultural meaning is built into systems, and that is the issue of identity and how our social identities are built into systems. And I don't mean something such as only gender identity or uh, racial identity or ethnic identity. What I mean is uh, not just those, but also the way that we uh, express ourselves through body language, facial expression, personality, fashion, discourse, and more. So it's a very expansive idea uh, of identity. And so I, I wrote a book that was mentioned, uh, that came out very recently, called Phantasmal Media. And the aim of this book, you could say in a nutshell, is to look at how cultural meanings are built into computing systems and how to design computing systems to be better sensitive to and better expressive of those kind of cultural meanings. And, and so you'll see what I mean by cultural meanings uh, as I give a few examples. So don't. Uh, uh, rest on just one example. I mean it in a very broad sense, the way you would use a term like concept. It can be concept that would represent a lot of different things. But uh, to begin to make it concrete, let's talk about one particular person's cultural meetings. And this is this guy, Bron. All right, so Bron uh, the Barbarian. Uh, here, you can say uh, uh, Bron is, uh, uh, is a guy who goes to shop, he goes to buy. This is the story of Bran as he goes to the bazaar. And so Bran has a particular set of cultural meanings or cultural characteristics he looks for when he wants to buy from somebody. And so Bran wants to buy from sellers where people are walking away with a smile. Right, Bran wants to buy from people that have a certain level of uh, hygiene. He wants to see the people who are walking away. He, he has some even stereotypical assumptions. He wants to buy from people of his own gender, even his own clan. So he has all of these ideas. And the question for today is what happens when Bran encounters a seller that looks like this? Right. So this is an eBay uh, seller. And, and that's what happens to a lot of us uh, these days, is that our sellers are reduced down to something computational, or uh, our identities, our personas in general. And so Bron has a sense of consternation. What do I do with my particular cultural meanings? So let's, let's take a look at how this system actually begins to represent uh, cultural meaning. So this is just one aspect. So I've just taken a snapshot of this eBay seller profile. And here we have a name, Happy. We have a numeric descriptor and, and this uh, uh, garish green star. Yeah, so the star means you have between a 5,000 and 9,999 rating. You get plus one rating for every sale that's been rated positively, a uh, decrement of one for every one that's rated negatively, and nothing for neutral ratings. And we could also begin not thinking just about the front end. Yeah, so that's the graphical screen representation that you see that, that's here. You could judge something about this person. Maybe they're happy or like happy things, and they've sold to a reasonable number of people. But what happens when we begin to look at uh, the back end? Right? So you could imagine that the back end of the seller's representation is represented. You know, so we have a name, uh, which is a string. Uh, right? We have a feedback score. That's an integer. So we just have a number there. And we have this uh, star. It's something like a GIF uh, file. And it, of course, we could have represented this on the back end in a number of different ways. Right? So we could have represented it like this. You know, so instead, you have a number of pixels. And so a matrix of pixels that describes everything that you just saw. We have a feedback score. That's just pixels. And the star, that's just pixels as well. So those are both computational representations on the back end. Yeah. But we could have represented it a different way completely. Besides this, we could have represented it something 
like uh, this. And so this would be bronze representation in which you have computational structures for the gender of the person, their hygiene, uh, images of the, of the people that have bought from them so you can see if they are in fact walking away with smiles and so forth. And so the idea is when you've not represented an eBay seller, something like bronze preferences, in fact, you have represented some kind of values there. Those are just the ones that eBay prefers instead of bronze. In this case, probably for the better. You probably wouldn't want to represent the system just for a bronze. And the point is that each of these backends, uh, whether it's the fictitious one for bronze that I came up with or the actual one that's used, encodes some kind of uh, cultural values on, on that back end, on the data side, right? The, the front end value could look something uh, similar. And so you have an image such as an interface uh, that's uncontroversial and immediately accepted. Nobody looks at the eBay seller and, and, and thinks, uh, what have they left out you know, from social values in that? We just use it, we don't really think much about it. And so when you have an interface that's uncontroversially accepted, unconsciously accepted, uh, without thinking about the values underlying it, then that's what I'm calling a phantasm. And so this is just one example of a kind of phantasm that, that emerges within a computing system, and that's based on the back-end representation, not just the visual screen representation. And you know, I give a number of examples in, in the book of phantasm. They're not all static images. Uh, they can be dynamic characters in games and social media. They're not all just identities. Essentially, it's cultural meaning as, as can be described by uh, thinking about the structure in the back end. And so this is a definition uh, of a phantasm, a cursory one that's explored at length in the book. But it's a, it's a notion that provides a way of describing blends of mental or sensory imagery. And so that, you know, that's what we see when we use the interface, whether it's a dynamic character or just the eBay seller representation, with concepts from a particular worldview. And this is the worldview of what eBay thinks is important for you to see about a seller. And then the concept is presented in a way that's useful for studying computing systems. And why use phantasm instead of any other concept? I'll just go over that very briefly. So one is that it really emphasizes the role of worldview when you look at, look at these systems, a semi-visible worldview. It's only visible when I contrast it to something else like bronze representation compared to the eBay one. Otherwise, we tend to just accept the representation used in something like, like eBay. Uh, in the book, I define it in cognitive science terms, and so something that came up earlier is this idea that uh, well, cognitive science in the past was thought of as studying just what's from here up, you know, just what's in the mind, what's in the head, but uh, some recent formulations of cognitive science actually look at the role of cognition in, uh, in the body, the way we think based upon our experiences of the body in the world, uh, the way cognition is distributed, we use artifacts and other people in the ways that we think, and then also situated, that particular cultural situations play a role in, in our cognitive processes. And then finally, uh, because work on the computer is implemented in a very systematic or formal kind of way, we need language to talk about the back end or these very formal or mathematical representations. And so those are some of the things that I think the term phantasm helps with in terms of analysis. So to make it more concrete, let's just look at one particular example and use phantasms as a lens through which to view how subjective experience, so the individual experience somebody has, say of an artwork, can be implemented within the structure of a digital system. And so to illustrate this, I thought, what could be more subjective and individual than thinking about life and death? Right, that's a topic that's explored in a lot of the different arts. And if you could represent something like meditating on life and death within a system, then how does the system function and how can we explain its function? Uh, and so to begin with, to say this is nothing that's just new to the computer, a lot of kind of works have looked at issues of life and death. In this case, we're just looking at how a computer, that uh, very uh, usually seen as objective medium, could express something that's so entirely subjective. And so we have other works like Emily Dickinson's uh, poem, Because I Could Not Stop for Death, and, and, and so forth, personifying death as, as an individual. And here, Robert Frost uh, uh, does, does a lot the same. And uh, one of the ways that death is sometimes described is through a conceptual metaphor. That's this idea of life as a journey. Right? So you get ahead in life, you have the end of the road, and you know, all these sort of ideas. These are concepts discussed by uh, the cognitive scientist George Lakoff. And that means there's a very, there's a structure we use a lot of time to understand life and death that has things such as the person leading life is a traveler. His or her purposes are destinations. The reason, uh, the, the means of achieving these purposes are uh, roots. And so you can imagine using this kind of metaphor 
And then you can make inferences and think about life and death. If I say, what happens if you stumble in life? Right? We have a sense of, of what that means. Uh, and so a lot of these kind of works like Dick Dickinson's actually invoke this kind of metaphor of life as a journey. And uh, that can be done no less in a computer game. So what I'll talk about is a computer game passage. Some of you may have, may have seen this game, an award-winning game by Jason Rohr. The whole system is 256 by 256 pixels. And, and uh, a number of people find the system to be especially evocative. It's a five minute game and, and, and I think uh, quite an interesting experience. So let me just play uh, a little bit so you can see what, what the system looks like. So if you, have, if you haven't seen the system, you start off your play, it's autobiographical. It was on the occasion of Aurora's 30th birthday, he began, began thinking about his mortality when a friend of his passed away. And so here you have him walking, he partners with somebody, you can partner or not partner. And you have the future, is this blurry space that's on the right hand side of the screen. Uh, as you walk, uh, the score increases, you get these points that are in fact uh, meaningless in, in some kind of way within the game, it just gives you more value. You have these obstacles, if you have a partner it's harder to get to those uh, treasure chests, uh, but the, the, the journey is more meaningful in a way because your point values increase uh, more. Right. And you see that the characters begin to be translated further and further to the right hand side of the screen. That means they're moving forward in life. Right. As you go further in the game, the character ages. You can see that he's a, a bald in here, the hair has changed color, still navigating the space. You have a transformation of the character himself. <laughs> right. Yes, he's still beautiful. <laughs> right. and, and eventually you get to the periphery of the screen. She passes away. You see that now the future is clear, and the left-hand side is actually the blurry side here. And now he walks and hunched over. He's almost at the edge of the screen. And he's replaced by this little garish tombstone. And that's it. That's the way the game always ends every time you play it. And, and a number of people, this is such a condensed experience, but this is an award-winning game, but a number of people have just found it to be quite resonant much as you can within, within the limited scope in terms of graphics and, and experience. And so I began to think about why is this game a kind of resonant met metaphor for a particular view on, on life and death. And so what I did was uh, conduct an analysis from the artist's statement uh, uh, about the game to see what was Rohr trying to do within this game. And so one of the things cognitive linguists do is they have a set of conventional metaphors like life is a journey. And so I found evidence that he was using these conventional metaphors. So you have things such as uh, uh, direction towards the end of life. He describes that there's a midpoint of life. Right, so we have directionality and, and uh, uh, journey. We have spatial metaphor for life. And so uh, right, that towards the end of life, future is left. Uh, as you grow older, there's territory in front of you that's uh, shrinking and so forth. Uh, and so there are a number of these kind of metaphors that he's invoking in, with, with, with the system. And so in bold, you see that's, that's where I've shown the evidence for the metaphor that's described on, on the left side of the screen. And so I found a number of the, the, these kind of metaphors and began thinking about, well, how did he take these metaphors he wants to convey through the system and then evoke those with the actual design? And if you think about it, that's what designers of a lot of systems do. You have an idea of what you want to express or what you want to build, and then you have to somehow map that to an actual implementation that you, that you, want, to, uh, that, that you want to develop in the system. And so the question then is, how would a game developer begin conducting that process of taking these very subjective ideas about life and death and then thinking about those in terms of game mechanics. And uh, uh, so this is, so what I've done in the book is taken this very mathematical definition of how you would describe and spec out one of these kind of systems and then represent it in a way that, that I think should translate more across, a, uh, across disciplines uh, and that's where you begin to look at the structure uh, of these systems. And so you have, for example, uh, uh, this is describing the sign space or semiotic space, you know, that's uh, the system itself. But you have subsorts, so you have different uh, part whole, or different subtype relationships between things that are in the space. You might have, say, uh, uh, different types of window, you know, text window and graphics windows that could exist uh, within the system. You have levels, so you might have the entire space, then you have it subdivided into past space, present space, and future space. So you have different part whole relationships. And then you also have priorities. So you might say, what was the most important thing to Roar about life and death? 
what, was, uh, what were other things sort of less important but still made into the system. So he has, you could say, a hierarchy of values that he wants to begin to express. And so I began describing that in a kind of systematic way here. And so you have the space that's, uh, that's described and you have the priority of the space that's sort of represented. That's sort of the most important thing is the overall life. We have uh, you know, the maze that's explored, the past, the present, and the future, and so forth. And then begin to think about the structure of the space and how that maps then into the actual implementation. And so the details of this are in the book, but the idea is that I've analyzed mappings to say what from the actual description of his ideas have made their way into the implementation. Uh, and in, the case, in this case, most of the aspects of the metaphor of life and death are actually implemented within the mechanics of the system itself. And so uh, you could, one way to phrase that is to say the priorities, his priorities, his values are preserved in the structure of the actual game. And, and so for example, you have uh, features such as the most important element is the entire screen. Of next greatest importance is the player character and the, the tombstone that replaces him. The player character and the tombstone that replace him are uh, important because that reflects oneself and one's own reflection on, on mortality. Uh, and so then next, most important within the whole life is the idea of past, present, and future. So those are the three areas that the screen is divided into, uh, and, and so forth. And so the idea is that uh, you can structurally see that all of these aspects of the life as a journey metaphor for thinking about uh, life and death are preserved within the structure of the game itself. Uh, and you could say that's a point of the analysis, is we can begin to look at these preservation values as a means of assessing the way that the systems convey phantasms. And so what I've hoped to argue so far is this idea that uh, phantasmal media helps to explore the technical aspects of systems, but how they implement subjective and cultural content. And that's just one, one example of this broad life and death metaphor. And so with the rest of the talk, I want to look at another type of, of content, not life and death, but that of social identity and, and the way that social identity is built into systems. And that will be described through the lens of this project, a five-year NSF-supported project I've, I've run and that uh, Stuart mentioned called the Advanced Identity Representation Project. And I should say that it's called the Advanced Identity Representation Project, not because the systems we create are so advanced, but I actually think what people do in the real world is quite advanced in terms of how we navigate, how we change our behavior. We might act one way in the home, another place in the classroom, another place with a loved one, another way with a loved one. And systems don't have that kind of nuance. When you go on Facebook, you can't just click a button very easily and say, all right, let me show the self that I want to show at home or the self I want to show at work, right? We're just reduced to strictly privacy settings. And let me give you a sense of what I mean by uh, computational identity systems. That could be anything ranging from uh, a computer game, virtual world, uh, uh, online account, and something like, like Amazon. And the issue is that our identities are implemented in all of these kind of systems nowadays. Everybody has one of these kind of systems. Most of them interoperate with each other. You might have to log in through Facebook to leave comments on ESPN, for example. Uh, and uh, now, uh, the question is, how do we represent ourselves in dynamic ways like we do in the real world, uh, thinking about issues of power relationships and, and other social issues, discrimination, through the lens of these systems we have on, on the computer? Right, and so uh, just this reminder again, not all phantasms refer to identity, but for the rest of the talk, I'll be focused on phantasms of identity. <coughs> and so this is a particular uh, computer game. Is anybody here familiar with what, compu what computer game this is? Uh, right, yeah, so a couple people recognize this. Yeah, so this is from Elder Scrolls IV, uh, Oblivion. And, and so this is from an kind of online manual. There's an actual screenshot from the game. Uh, and uh, I want to talk about what some of the problems are with some of these existing identity phantasms. And it's not just this game. I mean, this game actually has a number of laudable features. But I want to talk about one feature of this that, that, that has a, a bit of trouble. And so uh, in, in the sense of encoding stigmatizing assumptions. Yeah, so in this character, you have the ostensibly African characters that are called uh, Red Guard uh, that are described in terms like the stereotype of a black athlete. Yeah, so they're called the most naturally talented warriors. They are physically blessed with hardy constitutions and quickness of foot. Uh, and, and in gameplay, this actually translates into bonuses of running and jumping ability. Uh, and actually, the more you run and jump, the better you even get at, at those abilities. Uh, and similarly, the, the Nord characters are also, these are Viking-like characters, are optimized for physical combat only rather than kind of uh, intellectual or magical uh, pursuits. 
And uh, you could, and actually, the, the sequel to this game, Skyrim. I mean, these are best-selling games. They're not, they're not a, a kind of niche market game. And the sequel, Skyrim, generated an estimated 450 million dollars of sales. That's in the first week alone. And so, a question for those of you that might have seen this before, and others can guess too, is: Do you think that the sequel did anything different or improve upon the situation? All right. So I see a few heads that that that, uh, that, that are shaking here. Now that's uh, about the same. Actually, the red guard looks different in, in the sequel. I've been writing about this phenomenon in a number of articles you know, recently. Well, anyway, this is what the, the red guard. Oh. Before you change anything, this is the default red guard. <laughs> now, if you begin to play Skyrim, looks like uh, this. Right, so, uh, but actually, I think it's no better than than, than the other one. Uh, and let me say what the reason it is. So it's not again a superficial visual rep representation issue, or I should just say surface level representational issue. Rather, the issue is something like this. So if you look at the stats, but these are all, all the stats for all the different races within the game, fictitious races, but in this particular game, the, they represent sort of real world ethnic groups. So Bretons are considered usually the French group, Imperials are Romans, uh, Norse are kind of Scandinavian and so forth, along with some fictitious types. But if you look just at intelligence here, and you see the ones in red, if you're a Nord or Red Guard, by default, you're going to be 20 points less intelligent than your uh, ostensibly French or Breton uh, counterpart. Right? If you're an uh, Orc female, you're going to be 10 points more intelligent than your male counterpart. And so again, this is on the back end, like in the bra and the eBay example, on the back end we have difference. It's not just the visuals. So changing the Red Guard representation actually doesn't do anything uh, for, for, for this. But I think you can go a bit deeper than just default stats, because some people might say, well, you can play the game in a number of different ways, and the final impact of default stats is very little by the time that you're a high-level character. But let's look at another game. So this is an earlier uh, image from a game called Neverwinter Nights. Uh, it's a kind of Dungeons and Dragons-based role-playing game, also a kind of best-selling game. But when you look under the hood, you have data structures for features such as race, phenotype, and, and gender, and so forth. And it's, it's not my description. The data structure is actually called race and phenotype. And let me ask you a question which is, uh, should race in a game uh, impact the way that you look within the game? So, uh, what do you think? Yeah, so I, I heard a yes. Uh, in this system, in the back end, actually, uh, race does not change the appearance of your character. Uh, it, in fact, uh, many items have racially based uh, bonuses. Yeah, so uh, the actual character representation isn't determined by the race that you select in terms of data structure. Those are separated from each other. Phenotype, that's a term that's used in a number of different uh, uh, fields. And I said, what would phenotype mean in this game? I could ask you the same question, what do you think phenotype means? But you probably wouldn't just say that phenotype means whether you're of a large or normal shape, which is what the actual data structures for phenotype means in this game. How many genders should the game represent? Uh, so what do you think? Uh, yeah, so someone said three. Well, this game has five genders. Now, other people say it should be a sliding scale, or you should you know, have a, just put in whatever you want. This game has five genders. It has male, female, both, other, and none. But the interesting thing is, if you choose male, both, other, or none, by default, you have a male body type within the game. <laughs> right, so you have five genders, but 80% of them are male by appearance. Right, so that's, again, when you begin looking under the hood, you see all these kind of phenomena that are represented in the systems that wouldn't be revealed when you just began to look at the interface or the visual representation of, uh, on the screen. And, and so in this work, there are a number of kind of limitations of, of current systems that we can see. And I won't go over all of these, but for example, in computer games, your attributes are reduced down to just statistics. Uh, character change uh, is a lot of times, but not always, determined by combat, spatial exploration, and acquiring objects, virtual objects. A lot of uh, uh, passage is, is special in the sense that we have a transitioning identity over time in terms of aging. Many systems don't have a very seamlessly transitioning character, and usually it's just acquiring virtual artifacts. Uh, uh, joining a, a community. You know, so, what does it mean to join a group in Facebook? You can click a button, you're part of that group. You can click a button, and, and you're out of that group. But if you've seen films like uh, Mean Girls or other kind of films, you know that joining a group isn't as simple as just uh, clicking a button. <laughs> All right. So, you know, so you have to do a lot of negotiation. Sometimes you're going to be excluded for a number of, number of reasons. And, and so there are all these sort of things that happen in the real world that these systems don't do. And uh, my contention is that we have to do better in, uh, think, in thinking about this and building systems. And, and that's what the Advanced Identity Representation Project is, is all about. So I'll talk to you a little bit about that project. Uh, so we have uh, 
Yeah, so the way that I structured it uh, you know, five years ago when, when I wrote the grant is that at the bottom level we're coming up with new models, you can think about new theories, you know, new ways to think about identity across all of these different systems. So it's not just in a game, not just in an account, but thinking across all of them. Then we were thinking about cre creating new platforms, so new ways to build these identities that can do better, and then finally new applications, so that's actually building new social media sites or building new games that use the models and platforms that we built. Uh, and, and so now I'll talk just about just one very recent project that we built, you know, the sort of final outcome of, of the grant. There's a number of them that are on our website uh, that, uh, that you can go look at uh, at uh, icelab.mit.edu, but you can, uh, but I'll show just this one, which is called Chimeria. And uh, what does Chimeria do at its core? Well, I'll tell you a little story again of, uh, of what the system does. Yes, because if I just say it's a system for representing category gradients and category dynamics, then that's not totally clear immediately. So just imagine a story like this, that you're playing a game and you're playing as a knight at the beginning of the game, and you decide to dabble a little bit in magic. So you pick up a few magical abilities as you play the game, and you decide that this magical stuff is really not for you and decide to go back to uh, pure physical combat. Somehow that's lost its luster for you when you go back to combat and you decide to go, as they say, full mage. <laughs> you go until, totally to the wizard side. Well, maybe you might not resonate with this example, but imagine you're listening to Pandora, or your favorite musical site, and you listen mostly to punk rock music. But then you begin to dabble a little bit in jazz, and then you decide to go back to listening to punk rock, and then go full jazz. Right, so the story is the same in, in both of these cases, right? It's just that we've moved from total membership in a group to partial membership in the group. Uh, we have multiple memberships in different groups at different times. And what we're doing with Chimeria is mathematically modeling that movement between different social groups. Then you can use that model within games, social media, and other sites. And so it's a platform that we have, that we've built for building systems that, what I just described, that's the engine that's uh, at the bottom corner there. We have an editor, so you can build your own systems on top of it. And we're, we can tie it into other kind of existing systems that bring in data, like All Music Guide, or YouTube, or any other kind of site. You can build your own data, and then finally uh, build your actual systems, your applications on top of it. And this is just, a sense, just to give you a sense of what it looks like if you were to build a, system, build a story using the system. So we have a kind of interface you can use. And to make it more clear, I'll give you another story that we've actually built into the system, which is imagine that you have two different groups that, that exist. So we'll call them the Sylvans and the Brushwoods. You know, say the Sylvans are people that love fine poetry and elaborate clothing and all this sort of thing. And then you have Brushwoods. They're hardy, homespun people. They like uh, earthy clothing, just good tales by the fireplace and, and so forth. So imagine we have these two groups. You don't have to look like this. It doesn't have to be a fantasy story like it in the music. Uh, jazz punk rock example versus the gaming example, but you could have Sylvans and Rushwoods represent any kind of group that, that you like that's out there with that distinction. And within the system, you're not limited to two different groups. Yeah, so you're not limited to, say, having uh, uh, just these groups. You could have uh, upper, middle, and lower class. You could have any number of configurations that don't have to even be in a hierarchy. But, but for simplicity's sake, we'll start off with just these two groups. And one of the first things our system allows us to do is separate out what we're calling abstract categories from concrete categories. So that means you could say, this is the group that's going to be accepted in this world, and this is the group that's going to be rejected or discredited. And you could run the system and say, I want the Sylvans this time to be accepted. You could run it the next time and say, I want the Brushwoods to be accepted. And so it's not fixed within the system. You could imagine a computer game in which you go to different cities and they have different social structures in every city or even every character has a different social structure in their own head and treat you differently based on that. And then each of these categories, the concrete categories, have features like clan, gender, you know, height, speaking ability, a number of different features that you, can, that you can decide what you want for yourself. And so when we say uh, a brushwood or a sylvan, what we mean is you know, some set uh, of these features and values for each of those features will define what's a prototypical, you know, a, the, if you just think, Sylvan, in a stereotypical way, what do, what do you think of uh, there? And so what I described actually is a kind of stereotype. Not all Sylvans are going to be lovers of finery and elaborate poetry. You know, that's a stereotypical view that has a high speaking ability. That's what these bubbles that are almost filled up mean. High clothing, you know, clothing uh, kind of performance and height. And it's in the clan, which is called a Sylvan. And so a prototypical brushwood that you know, 
you know, so lower speaking ability according to some worldview, lower clothing, lower height, and, and so forth. And so what our system can then do is implement where you have some character that is a brushwood, but maybe you're a brushwood that uh, is somewhat tall and, and speaks in a way that Sylvans would deem to be you know, well-spoken. Right? So then we have this kind of gradient membership in the category from the point of view uh, of the Sylvans. Right? And actually, in, in the humanities, there's a term called a passing that people usually use for this, this sort of thing. So that means you could be a brushwood, but pass as a Sylvan. So you could be a well-dressed, quote, eloquent uh, brushwood and be somewhat accepted in some, in some situations but by, by the Sylvans. And the other thing that we begin to represent within the story is that it's not that these categories are static. They actually change at different points, whether different points of the day, different points in life. And so we call this idea of a naturalization trajectory in which you could start off as a brushwood and then change your speaking ability and the way that you dress, you know, put on your, your silver tuxedo or, uh, or uh, a gown, and eventually maybe even pass some threshold for acceptance within the Sylvan community. And so the idea then is we can have the story change not just based on your categories at any given, at any given moment, but we could have people treat you differently also based, based on the whole history of your traje trajectory over time. And what we've done with this is implement some ideas that come from a sociology. So this is work of Irving Goffman where he notices phenomena such as disidentifying. So these are ways that people manage impressions of them. So let's say if you're illiterate, then you might put on glasses in order to seem that you're more literate in some, in some settings. Right? So people might change their names in order to fit in within a particular society. So all of these sort of things that people do, we can now implement with our system with, within space of a game. And, so we, and the way that we do it is using these naturalization trajectories. So let's imagine that uh, you have uh, been monotonically increasing within your uh, acceptance by the Sylvan. Well, that means that after some threshold, you've intentionally passed because you tried to become a member of the other group. You could also have kind of gone back and forth. You decided to put on something different for the day and maybe inadvertently been accepted within the group. Right? You could also try to pass but actually fail. That just because you put on glasses, as soon as you try to read something uh, in, in the news, then, uh, then you've actually slipped and not passed. And so we have all these kind of social phenomena that we can now, uh, that we can now represent with, within the system. And so what I'll do is just give an example of the system actually uh, running so you can see what it looks like. So we build a game called Gatekeeper that, that demonstrates what the system does. Okay, so we have now the Sylvan and the Brushwoods have been at war for ages. The Sylvan, known as the tall people on average, are sometimes judged from afar to be lovers of finery and elaborate poetry, as we know. The Brushwood are seen as small people, some judged from afar to be fond of earth, earthy, homespun fabrics and good hearth tales. In this case, you're a Sylvan, so remember that, and you're before the gate of a keep that's guarded by a Brushwood. So in this case, the Brushwoods are the, gate, are the gatekeepers and, and the privileged. And so you need to enter the neatest dire. You are tall, wearing fine clothes, and articulate. You see a brushwood guard with sturdy armor. He looks preoccupied. Okay, so what do you do? Do you dust off your boots? Do you adjust your clothes in the gilded mirror that you have? Untuck your tunic or hide your fine jewelry? But well, you can choose. Okay, so you hide the jewelry. He likes that, so he smiles approvingly. And you think to yourself, I'm trying to fit in with these brushwoods. So it's not just their reaction, you're actually reacting to your own transformations of yourself. So he has a wary expression, and he asks you a question. We don't see many of your kind, well, we don't see many new folk around this part, uh, he says. It seems like he's going to say, we don't see many Sylvan around here. And so do you say, tis not far from home. Oh, yes, a good man, this is a strange land to me. New, I'm from just around the way. Or I'm from a little ways off indeed. A little ways off. Okay. Ah, he doesn't like this. <laughs> right, so it doesn't seem like he wants to let you in. He looks curious. Do you speak to him in your own language, uh, Sylvan? Uh, do you say hello, greetings, brother, good day, Brushwood? Uh, so what do you say? Okay, so greetings, brother. Yeah, he likes that. And you're trying to fit in. He looks curious. Do you speak to him in your own language? Say some weather we're having today, good day, or I hope you are faring well. A star shines upon the hour of our meeting. <laughs> uh, you want which one? Weather. Okay, weather. All right. 
Okay, he's approving. All right, so he says, welcome. I think you'll be at home here. Yeah, so that's, that's one ending of the story. But you think to yourself, I got in, but I had to pretend to be something that I'm not. Right? So it's not just that you got in. There's also the kind of internal psychological impact of the experience. And just to show you for a contrast, let me go through it just one more time, but I won't get your input. And also, you know, there's a structure behind it I can show. So there's a narrative structure. See, this is the entrance clause. We have motivation clauses. We're doing checks here. So we have different values this, to check to see whether your clothing are in the accepted category and so forth. You know, so this is just showing a little bit of the back end of, of what's happening. And so let's say that we uh, do, let's say, use our gilded mirror. Right, and, you see, and so you see the trajectory. You know, we're decreasing in our trajectory here. But uh, the immediate effect is that we're still accepted at the current moment. So this is just to give you a sense of what's going on behind the scenes in, in the system. And so we'll speak in our own language. Let me turn off all of this. And you're, but you think to yourself, I'm being myself. Straighten up, stand tall about this uh, smaller guy. And speak in our own language more. He's really not liking anything that we're doing. And he says, you're not welcome here. And so that, that's one yeah, outcome. And close this, but then also show you that those weren't the only possible endings for each of those possibilities. And so you don't need to, you know, this is small, you don't need to read all of it right now, but let me just point out a couple of different points, is that all the endings in the red are ones in which you don't get in, uh, are, are, are ones that are deemed as kind of negative endings, and then you have all these ones where you, where you don't get in, but within, we have polarities that are negative or positive, whether you get in or not. And so, for example, you could get in, and then you get this, you know, what we got, well, you could have gotten something like, thankfully I got in, rather than the negative one, which is the theme of denial of self, which we did get that time. Well, I had to pretend to be something I'm not. And so you could have run through it, doing exactly what you did, gotten in, but then you're just happy that you got in, regardless, because you passed. And similarly, you could have just stuck to yourself and been Sylvan the whole time. There's a phenomenon that Goffman calls a stigma allure, but it's basically being exoticized, where you got in, uh, uh, but they say, that's glad to have you in here. It's great to have just a little sylvan flavor in the place. Right? So that's where you, don't, you, get, you get in, but you've been acting yourself the, the entire time. So you have all of these different kind of possibilities uh, you know, with, with the, the system raises. And just to show you the different, the different sort of uh, things you can do with the Chimeria system, I'll end with this example, which is a, a social network uh, that has the same kind of gradients of, of categories, but this is one that looks like uh, musical categories, and it's a kind of social network on um, which you play out musical taste. And so we'll call ourselves a C21 here. And so I need a few recommendations of artists. So if you log in through Facebook, it can use the likes you already have for music on Facebook. But in this case, uh, I'll, I'll just get a few suggestions from the audience. So what are some artists that, that you like? Pixies. All right, that's a good one. So uh, Pixies, well, if, uh, before. Uh, Kim Deal left, <laughs> so that's a good one. <laughs> so, uh, all right, any other suggestions? Okay. All right. Okay, we need a final suggestion. Okay. All right. Yeah, so you see we have this type of head functionality. So we're tied into an external system called Ruby Core Cloud Services that, that's giving us all of this uh, information live. So after I run this, then what we're doing is constructing what musical category it, the system sees you as being a part of right now. Again, it doesn't have to just be binaries, but we're starting off just for illustration, just with two different binaries here. And then we'll construct a photo wall that represents uh, the different artists that you've said that you like. And then along the side, we're going to have a dialogue that takes place between different, between different fictitious characters. So we're describing the way that you move within this narrative as a kind of a conversational narrative that plays out between, the, between these two characters. So in a sense, I've showed you with the previous system, the kind of fantasy example, and then with this system, I'm showing the, the kind of social networking uh, example. And so it should, hopefully it should load up soon. I think I have a fairly fast uh, broadband connection. Right, although the Pixies and, uh, and, and Taylor Swift might have thrown it for a loop in, ter in terms of, uh, in terms of combining, in combining those, but I think it should be, it should be processing.
down right. on our fast bandwidth. Here. Yeah. Okay. Right. Well, I'll try it one more time with the same ones, and if not, then uh, I'll show you what it does. But it's, it's, but it seems to be logged on because it's finding finding them. And so as it's trying to load up, I should also mention that just playing out in game or playing out in social media isn't the only kind of thing that the system can do. You could also just chart this out in a purely kind of mathematical way, or you can chart it out in, in a way which is based on, that's a kind of 3D graphical version and have the character change over time you know, based on, on that uh, character. And so maybe I'll let it load in the background and then see, you know, go on a little bit, come back in a few and see if it's a, Done loading. I usually use the Ethernet cable because it requires a pretty fast uh, connection. And so, anyway, this is what the system uh, looks like. You know, so we have different characters that are that start talking on the side. Uh, right. So you begin. You know, you're in a certain kind of group. You have oppositional groups like jazz, pop, and rock. Yeah, some neutral people that come in. And so they might bring up a suggestion such as. Uh, uh, oh, well, maybe you'll like this music. You can go in and click on it, say if you like it, and then your membership in that category changes. Your photo wall over the other side begins to change, but then somebody else might say that, hey, I thought you liked pop rock. I never paid you for a jazz nut, and they begin to you know, give some input there, and uh, say, so you seem kind of soft lately. And the soft isn't something that's coming, that's pre-written, it's actually using this external database that has themes and moods describing all of those artists and generating that conversation on the fly, right? And, but other people might begin to reject you based on your changing membership. Well, that's odd, you said you liked Jimi Hendrix, but now you're a huge fan of jazz. And so again, your membership is changing uh, over time. And that's That's still living. Right. So the bottom line then for uh, Chimeria, and maybe I'll bring it back up during Q&A and you'll actually see the system running, but Chimeria offers researchers and developers a way to represent category gradients and category dynamics. Uh, it, it's a system that's tied in actually to the real world and real world data, so that's that's why it takes some time. So we're bringing in information from the Roby Corps, cloud services, from YouTube, from other sort of places. The Chimera system uh, also enables system, the systems to reveal phantasms of identity. You know, so you can model aspects of phenomena such as stigma, marginaliz marginalization, the intersections between multiple categories, uh, you know, a number of different identity categories, and more. And so remember me, you know, so the Braun at the very beginning, when you didn't know where I was going with the story of Braun the Barbarian. Yeah, so uh, the idea is that actually phantasms such as the one that we saw at the beginning, those uh, unconscious cultural values that were built into the eBay profile are often implicit and invisible to users, whereas phantasms in these kind of systems that we built are actually theoretically grounded in theories from sociology and other areas. They're explicitly designed, so we're designed with awareness of the cultural values that are being built into the system and we're using them for social modeling and expression. And in this case, we've used them to model these different phenomena related to uh, passing and stigma and, and depression management. And so we've done a number of different kind of uh, uh, projects. So ranging from a, a game that this was just uh, an article about it just came out uh, in the Electronic Book Review, a game about experience of microaggression, everyday covert acts of discrimination, such as say saying to an Asian American colleague, can you help me with that math problem based on a stereotype, or assuming somebody's a criminal just because of the way they look, and, 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 and saying subtle kind of uh, uh, discriminatory remarks to them. We built other systems that use gesture to drive the story forward, we studied social status in, in, in computing systems, and a number of different kind of works. Again, you can find that on, on our website. But the uh, bottom line is that our work is looking at uh, the ways in which subjective, cultural, and critical aims can be the aims of computing. And so subjectivity, culture, and criticality aren't the typical things that computing is often associated with. Usually people think of terms more like productivity and objectivity. And my contention, instead of productivity and objectivity, actually that great expressive, critical, and empowering uses of digital media can result from effectively using their unique computational means of prompting and revealing phantasms. So.
thank you. Okay, so I'll open for any questions that you might have to. I guess here and then. Um, yes. Um, so thank you. Really interesting talk. And I'm just wondering if you could say a little bit more about uh, the kind of feedback between represent trying to uh, unpack and represent these processes of um, these social processes. And then at the same time, tracking the way that we adjust our own, you know, self-invention and social relations to the categories of sociality, you know, to the modes of sociality that we're become familiar with on the internet. So, um, you know, to what extent are my social relations actually changing in the way I use eBay and Facebook, et cetera? And, and are you also kind of are you thinking through the way that we're we're constructing reconstructing our social relations in a, in response? Right, so that's a great question. So uh, to, just to, to recap, uh, I think the question is, you know, what are some of the kind of responses I'm getting to this? And are there particular communities you're thinking of responses? You mean like in academia, computer science, or humanities, or? Well, I'm just wondering if you're thinking about the feedback between um, the way that actually we, 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 social, we socialize and construct our identities differently based on the, the forms of, you know, the available Right. Right. Yeah. So that was the second part of your question was Sorry. about the way, the way that this that, that these systems might change the way we construct our identities. And the first part was just about general feedback. And so I'll skip to the second part then, since that's what you, what you emphasize. And yes, there are a number of different kind of phenomena that, that arise with within these kind of systems. And, and so the, the Nicole Ellison, somebody at, at uh, Michigan State, who talks about topics like aspirational identities and systems like dating sites. And so that's where it's not really a fictitious identity that people are representing, but it's an aspirational identity. It's you as if you, you'd like to be in the future. So you write that you work out because, yes, you're going to work out in, in a few months, right? So th th these sort of things. Right? So, uh, and so you have these kind of configurations. And then we also have distributed identities. So using a number of different systems. And, and something interesting now is that you can look at the relationship between them because the systems interoperate. So you can go in and say, now, this person is writing all these kind of incendiary, incendiary remarks in the comments section. We can gain some additional insight because now you've had to log in through Facebook in order to leave those comments. Right? And so now we can run systems to find correlations between the two. And so one of the things that we did was take a, a social network. You know, so there's a system called Steam. It's a game distribution platform, but also a social network. People find friends on it. They, they leave forum posts. They do a number of so, they, social networking, uh, a, a number of social networking kind of operations on it. And then games that people can buy using Steam. Like there's a game called Team Fortress 2. And then Team Fortress 2 is an interesting one because people buy hats within, within, within the game. These hats can be worth real world dollars, like thousands of real world dollars. And there are sites that act as, as auction sites for this. And in the same way that in the real world, somebody might wear a pair of Nikes, or maybe in 1920, they're wearing a top hat because they want to seem like they're from some social status. We can go in and analyze why are people wearing those sort of things. Unlike the real world, you know, when you ask somebody, why are you wearing those Nikes? And they say, oh, they look nice. In this game, we actually have data about how they're socializing, how many friends they have, who they're networking with, and then also how they even acquired the item. You know, was it part of online promotion? Was it gifted to them? So now we can find all these insights about social status as it takes place in the social network. And then so there's a different kind of social status. We actually use what are called, it's what's called tie strength. So can we, based on the prediction, of, so this is based on the idea of uh, Mark Granovetter, uh, where you have strong or weak ties between people in your social network. We're calculating the strength of ties by things like how many posts do you leave on some of these pages? What are the kind that you use? Very emotional language or non emotional language? You're calculating the strength of that connection you have with that person and all of these other features <coughs> of someone in the social network, and then finding how does that play out with how they perform in a game right? and, or in a virtual world. And so, you know, I think the previous idea is we have all of these identities, but they're separate. In fact, we're saying there are some links in terms of the correlations between those. And those are the sort of things that we're beginning to discover better understand. And so, you know, I, I think one of the major ways that, is, that things have changed is the fact that people now understand their identity isn't just singular. You have all of these different identities, and you can actually pinpoint them in different media. And that's one of the things we're beginning to study. And actually use AI to also help study and understand those identities better. Uh, yes? Thank you. For, I thought this was fascinating. I think your work is really exciting. I, it's, it's not 
not my area, so I'm not, uh, I'm not able to speak very intelligently, but I think I'm going to repeat maybe a version of the same question, which is that it seems to me that what you're, you're demonstrating it actually exceeds the framework with which you're presenting it in the following way. You, you, both in your presentation and your response, you, you refer to the real world and then the virtual world when it seems that your, your work is premised on the fact that this dichotomy you know, slips away uh, in all kinds of interesting ways. Um, I mean, for one thing, some of us might be here because we actually joined the C21 Facebook group. And so we meet in the real world because of our mediated existence in this virtual world. That would be one trivial example. But then the other side of it, and this is where my question might be a little more um, weary, which is, you, you say that this is about critical computing, but the example you gave in response is a, the kind of harvesting of information that can happen unbeknownst to the user in a way that needn't be at all critical, but rather more manipulative. And so I, I wonder whether there's any way of spinning it such that this is indeed critical and not just reinstating in what you've been calling the virtual world what are already constraining identities in the real world. Because the last thing I would want for myself or for anyone else is a game that reproduces all the constraints and, and, uh, of, of the real world. Right, yeah, those are great questions. I, I actually love these questions. Yeah, so the, the, first, you know, the, the first issue is about you know, our identities already blends between the virtual and the real, and in fact, Yes, so you know, I gave the nutshell version in, in the discussion today, but there's an article I have toward a theory of critical computing that's on C-theory. And so I talk about, you know, there are a number of ways that people describe this. Yeah, so James G you know, describes it as, you know, there's a real and virtual and also the projective identity. And so that's thinking about how we project aspects of ourself onto the virtual identity. And uh, actually, I would take it a step further to say that there's all, that we're almost always living in the space of projective identities, how I put it within that story, which is a kind of conceptual blend between what you see as yourself and the, and the affordances of, of the system. And so there's a duality there, which is that you have your own self-conception you know, and the social conception that people might have of you that's not just a real in a physical sense, but also socially constructed, contextually constructed. Then you have the system and what its affordances are. On the system side, that can tap into another but a number of other systems, so that's network. And you can ask, where does the data within that system come from? Is it just one designer? Is it, is it tapped, tied into other systems? It, it, uh, is it kind of driven by the crowd or uh, data-driven in some way, like uh, by Google searches and so forth? And so you have this nexus where you have a blend between both of these sides. And even something as simple as, uh, icon, uh, as an agent like uh, Pac-Man, in fact, is in a space of the blended identity because it's your control that's being mapped on to the icon. So I wouldn't even call Pac-Man a, a virtual identity. You know, right. So most of the work that I'm doing is actually right at that nexus point. And so when I talk about these systems, I talk about terms of user agency and a system agency and the ways that those intersect. And they always rely upon one another. So user agency with the system is always enabled by the affordances of the system. But system agency and seeing the system as agentic or having some control or power structures built within it is always based on the interpretation of cultural values of actual users. Uh, so so uh, that, right, the question allowed me to elaborate upon, upon those, those points, but that's the way that, that I see it. And then the other issue uh, is, uh, I think, yes, there's a, there's a strong danger with some of these kind, with some of, these kind of uh, systems, you know, with using AI and data mining techniques. In our own systems, we have some ways we mitigate against it in terms of using uh, only publicly available you know, data and making sure that all users are aware of what we're doing and user studies and human subjects and so forth, and then using it to illuminate, to help people understand the way that these processes are built in the system. So for example, within the book, I talk about recommender systems and the algorithms that, are, that underlie recommender systems, such as used on Amazon. And in fact, if you read the technical papers, there are users that are called gray sheep and black sheep. And these are, you know, that's the technical terms that they use for users for whom these systems fail because they uh, have tastes that can't be categorized or they're just so idiosyncratic that, 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 that the system can't, can't handle them. Uh, and so what it began to expose is a way that recommender systems actually build consensus because they find things that people are actually interested in. They suggest things that people in the so-called network neighborhood also tend to like, show those things back to you, and begin to build this kind of consumerist consensus for, the, for those objects. So in terms of the critique,
critique that we provide, we're always trying to expose these kind of phenomena. The, similarly with social status, say, giving people the tools with which you can expose the phenomena of how social status is playing out in this domain. And I gave the example earlier today that I think that's a challenge with any kind of sociological analysis in the sense that you can study a phenomenon like, like redlining you know, district, dist districting within city, and then use it and say, all right, well now we know better to, how to exclude people from certain areas and, and, and so forth, and use it in this kind of way. In this final third of the book, it's on comp critical computational empowerment. And so that's where I begin to show some ways we're not constructing phantasms, but actually revealing phantasms. And so using simulation where you go through the system in multiple ways, and by going through multiple in multiple ways, it actually reveals the functioning of the system or the phenomenon. And that's what we try to do with stigma in primary gatekeeper. That's not to say indoctrinate people with the value that exclusion is bad, but actually you know, here's a number of ways you can interact. You can get in, you can be excluded, you can be ex accepted, you can feel bad about yourself, good about yourself. You have all these different uh, possibilities, but you can begin to think systematically about that phenomenon. And similarly with the work on microaggression, the system called mimesis, that's the way a lot of our systems uh, work. And, and so it's actually exposing the fact that worldviews are built into these systems is one of the ways that we use it for engendering critical awareness. And then finally being tied into how these systems bring in values and data from other sources, like surveillance sources and other areas, and, and calling attention to that, and thinking about issues of conceptual and social change based on making people reflect critically and consciously, I, I think is one of the kind of other aims. We talk about, and, and then also building their own systems too, because part of critical computational empowerment is having the ability to be a maker and doer uh, of these kind of works. And so that's the other thing, we build ways for people to enter it at various, various different levels and then use the systems themselves to build challenging kind of artworks. But it's, it's a major issue when you begin to do any of this kind of work, is you know, how do you avoid the work being co-opted for forces that you don't want to, uh, that, that, and, and it's just you don't want to be supported by the work, but I think it's not exclusive to computational work. Yes. So first, thank you for kind of flashing me back to Never Winter Nights and so long time since I've been in that Second, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how, if at all, you see dynamic range that exists. Because first, you seem to talk about this question of uh, accommodation, where something like stigmatized forces don't really account for a lot of gray space. Uh, and the second level, it seems like something like gradient or dynamics allows for more of that, but also seems to suggest that now something like dynamic range becomes this kind of value identity. I don't know if it's necessarily something like cosmopolitan. Uh, it seems like being able to switch between these becomes increasingly important or operational space. All right, so that's a good question because it's one of the first reactions. I'll give an assignment sometimes that as students you know, pick their favorite identity representation system or any identity representation system out there and then find some limitation of it and then design a way to do better. And so one of the first responses we'll get a lot of time is, well, let's just take something that was a binary and make it continuous. Let's have a, gen a gender scale that's just continuous. You'd be more or less masculine or feminine. And, and, you know, and it, like you say, that's just representing, replacing that worldview with a different worldview. And so what I'll show them is systems like, actually Facebook introduced some of this you know, recently, but before you have male, female, and, and then you had other within it and how you can have t type in you know, gender category. But when I began showing this, then, then we have, uh, you know, I contrasted Facebook, we have male, female, and other, to a site called Gender Fork. And in Gender Fork, this is an online forum where you have options to say, define what pronoun you want to be used. You, know, that you, you, you can upload photos, you have ways to describe who I'm interested in. You have, so it's, it's not really, it's not a dating site, but it's a site where you can talk about your gender identity in, ask people to, to refer to you in the way that you want to. So that's a very multivalent kind of site. And so if you were to say, bring the idea of a continuum or slider to that community, then that would be deemed insufficient. And so what I'd rather say is, look at the underlying values of any community, whether those values are that of the gradient scale between binaries, the 50 different features and so forth, and say, just recognize that you're building cultural values into the system and say, what are the needs and values of your user group that you want to try to, that you want to, try to support? Are there places in which you're actually trying to create an insurgency to change the values of that group? Are you trying to support the values in a user-centric kind of way? And then you're doing it in a, in a knowledgeable kind of way. You're building a system that's based in critical analysis, either taking your own ideas, taking ideas from studies that are out there that other people have done, say gender, race critical, or categorization experts, or you're 
doing a user-centric study. We're saying, what do people in that community need? And then trying to serve those needs. And so there are a number of ways you can uh, do this. But I wouldn't suggest that you know, my idea here is just to say, replace you know, the existing values and then always put in a gradient or always put in exactly what we have here. Actually, the system could be used to implement a whole host of different kind of cat categorical structures. And that's what I think is interesting. Because people will say, I mean, this is, you know, so, uh, I think Stuart said, let's not mention a Gamergate uh, uh, here, but we, but we can say that I think one of the, the, the ways in which it's reactionary is this idea that you think of this kind of, uh, a kind of intervention is always going to be like a diversity training tool. That means just like a United Colors of Benetton, the game is the, is the idea. And in fact, that's not really what I'm suggesting here. What I'm saying is that we could build more nuanced models that would make the game more interesting and expressive for everybody. And sometimes that could even be a negative model. You know, say, let's build uh, racial profiling or gender discrimination in the game in a sense that you can better understand it through experiencing it, at least through the lens of simulation within the game. So not uncritically, but critically in the way that a science fiction author like Octavia Butler or Philip K. Dick might, might, uh, might write in, in their novels. And so the, uh, I'm actually more interested in the expressive range of these technologies than uh, indoctrinating people with any particular identity, of, uh, in any particular politics about identity, whether it's gradient or, or otherwise. I think that actually having a proliferation of different types of underlying models is what, what's more useful in the end. Yeah, Fox, I want to ask a, a theoretical or question or a little more abstract, I guess, about your understanding of the relationship between computation and, let's just say, mediation. Because sometimes you talk about computation as a medium, and then that makes me, as a media theorist, hesitate a bit because it seems to me that computation runs, you know, algorithmic computation runs under all sorts of different media. So there are algorithms, algorithm computation for games, but also for shopping sources, also for representation of uh, digital uh, imagery, things like that, mapping, so on and so forth. And so I guess the, the question is, you know, do you think you're, is there, is there, are there steps that are being left out or steps that you want to at some perhaps later time focus on? I mean, I think for example, of, in other words, is computation a medium, or is computation the kind of uh, technology that allows for media to exist? The way in which, let's say, a camera or a movie camera allows for film, or editing decks allow for films to be made, and things like that. So that when you think about like film analysis of gender, uh, one of the things that one focuses on are camera angles, the objectification of female bodies, right. and things like that that happen uh, not through algorithms of features of characters or things like that, but through actually, in this case, you might even call them, you know, cinematic algorithms in that regard. So I just, I guess I'm just curious about your understanding of computation. I mean, most of your examples are games. I mean, in a certain way, if you were saying, okay, I'm interested in the medium of gaming, then I get it. But you're seeming to want to do, make a larger claim about right. computation more broadly. So right, I guess yes. I'd just be curious on how you understand that relationship. Right, yes, yeah, so let me see. I should have something that describes this a, a bit. Good. And so I'll bring up this image, but also begin, begin to answer. And so that's a, yeah. Well, film is both a technology and a medium, right? So we talk about cinema and film as a, as a, kind, of, a kind of medium, and, and there are a number of different sort of things. So work like uh, moth light, if people are familiar, right? We're just putting dust and moth wings on, on the, it, uh, it calls attention to materiality in a technical sense, but also is a kind of mediatized experience. And so that's just to say that I think computation certainly is a, a kind of technical you know, process, but also I think that we do have computational media uh, now, and, and you know, I don't think it's a singular uh, medium, but I think there are shared characteristics between between those. And so that's not just uh, uh, you know, me, but I, but I think the number of scholars that begin taking that, that, that you could call it mediatized turn. You know, so you know, Janet Murray and talking about you know, the procedural encyclopedic and other characteristics, and Lev Manovich uh, later on, and Espen Arkset begins to talk about uh, kind of dynamics of, of medium and you know, you know, that with transcoding. So you have all of these different kind of ways that people begin to say, there's something here, we have enough kind
kind of mediatized experiences that, that, that are mitigated through computation that we can begin to think about computational media in some, in some kind of broader sense. And so you know, you know, I appreciate that turn, but I don't want to just leave it there. So I'm interested in certain kinds of things that the medium can then uh, do. So in terms of imaginative world building is one, you know, building these kind of phantasms, building cultural meanings. And so this idea then of building cultural meanings using these kind of tools that, that are characteristic of the computer when it's used for, uh, for media. And so that's, you know, that's a kind of linkage between, between the ideas that, that, that I'm interested in. And so just to take the idea of identity, the, the, the way that this would work is to say that, uh, and uh, in the book, it, a lot of the examples aren't in fact just gaming. So I talk about the you know, recommender systems with Amazon and, and, uh, and, and a host of other kinds of systems, a kind of system about the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina and, and so forth. So I, see, I show just a couple of examples uh, uh, today, and, and so here we have one of the core ideas underneath the Mass Identity Representation Project, which is, let's say you have social networking profiles, avatars, characters, online services, so some of which you might say that buying something, is that a medium or is that a service, and, and so forth, but underneath them there's some set of shared characteristics, and so that means you might have static media assets, like, like an image, flat text, modular graphical models, such as 3D or 2D models there, stats, formal annotation uh, attached to it that you could use to do algorithmic processing and logic-based processing, and then some procedural rules. That's to say the character after you don't act for a certain amount of time, folds its arms, starts tapping its uh, foot because it's getting bored. All right, so you have this shared set of characteristics that you can then look at across each of these different kind of systems, and there's something computational at their core that lets you analyze each one in a similar sort of way. And so that's where you find reciprocity, say, between a social identity in an online account and then one that you have in the video game. And we can do some similar analyses, for example, you know, we, I have a, another slide where I show the network of all of your affiliations within a game and then your network within uh, Facebook. And so in, in Facebook, it's not just games, but it's, all, it's not just uh, friends, but also your preferences and so forth. And so I show that we can do some similar analyses with your Facebook profile as we in fact can within the game. And, and so I think that's where I begin to find yeah, you, you could say this move towards uh, medium, but actually I would prefer even a term like, uh, like vehicle of, of cultural meaning uh, is more fundamental than, say, medium of communication. But, but in fact, it's these synergies, the fact that these underlying processes of data structuring and, and algorithmic thinking actually underlie cultural meaning making, whether it's used for explicitly expressive purposes, also for productive purposes, but I tend to focus on the less productive or subjective purposes because I think that's something that's been underserved in the area of, of, of computing. Okay, yeah, any, any other questions? Right. So I encourage you to go online. So the system, the Chimera system I mentioned, that I, th I think we need a really quick uh, connection for it since, uh, since it's online, but I encourage you to go and it's on our website and so you can play around with it uh, yourself since, since it's uh, up. Thanks. Uh, if people want to join us upstairs, we have a little reception and uh, we'll continue the talk there. Thank you. Right, thank you.